Hey folks, uh, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a really good conversation with a lady called Aurora Herrera, who is from Trinidad. She's a journalist. She's doing a PhD in journalism at City University, focusing on the West Indies and the Caribbean, which is really interesting. And we have a chat around where people are consuming their media and news from, uh, online, social media networks versus like traditional print. Uh, we talk a little bit about whether news content is getting better or worse, the influence of media organisations, censor- censorship, uh, and all that cool stuff. And I hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Boom, and we're live. Aurora. Hey. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. I think we've already just done two podcasts, but we haven't recorded them. <laughs> it was great. No, they were great. This one's going to be just as good. So, what is your background? In? In life. In life. Um, okay, well, I always say, the first thing I say is I'm a journalist. Um, just funny when you say, what's your background? I, th- I get that question a lot with my ethnicity oh, and really? my accent in London. So, when you ask me oh, that, in London. Got, yeah, yeah. you're asking about that. Um, so so what do you say to both? To both. Well, first I say I'm a journalist. Currently I'm uh, reading for my doctorate at City University of London. So I'm a journalist, but I'm not currently a working journalist. I'm okay. currently doing research. Yeah, it's your PhD. It's researching first and foremost journalism culture in Trinidad and Tobago, and then how the government utilizes, uh, for example, the cyber crime law, the defamation law in order to influence journalism culture. Interesting. We'll have yes. to delve into that. Definitely. A lot of people think I'm going to get into some trouble researching <laughs> that, but I haven't so far. So that's been, um, that's Perfect. been really lucky. Uh, ethnicity wise, my, essentially very simple. My dad is Indian and my mom is Spanish and indigenous. Oh, so wow. it's a, yeah, a mix of awesome those. mix. Yeah, I think so. I think and you grew up in given, Trinidad. I grew up between Trinidad and Venezuela. Ah. So I grew up mostly in Trinidad, but from the time I was about 14 years old, my mom and I, we traveled extensively back and forth to Venezuela. So I do have a healthy amount of love and respect for Latin America and also particularly Venezuela, which I mean, right now um, is going through a huge crisis and I'm at actually a fellow of One World Media and I'm doing a documentary right now on the Venezuelan refugee crisis oh, yeah. and its effects on Trinidad, yeah. Amazing. So is, is this a filmed documentary? Pardon? Is it a proper documentary? Yes. Amazing. Yes. How, when is it going to be released? Well, we have, as a, as a fellow of One World Media, they gave us a year to do the documentary. Right. So I got the green light, so to speak, yeah. in January. So essentially I have until next year, January. But while whilst I was in Trinidad for the past couple of months, I was filming on weekends. So basically every weekend uh, since... Um, Amazing. Yeah. So you have to go to Venezuela? Well, actually, that was the plan. Uh, two yeah. weeks ago, I was supposed to be in Venezuela. However, we have a fixer on the Venezuelan side. Right. And they told us that we shouldn't be coming across at this point because it's way too dangerous. Because really? there's a lot of piracy on the channels that we're supposed to take from Trinidad to Venezuela. So you take a boat right. from Cedras to a place called yeah. Tucupita. And the channel there, um, there's a lot of piracy going on and people getting held up on the river. Can't you just take a plane? You Well... You can, but the thing is that if you fly into Caracas, you have to take this bus all the way down to the areas that we wanted to go to and investigate. Uh, right. So what's happening right now in the refugee crisis, a lot of people are coming to border towns. If you're coming to Trinidad and they're taking boats mostly, not many people are flying in, very few. And actually, one of the things we filmed, um, a situation arose where there are a number of Venezuelans turned, uh, they tried to turn them back at the airport or refuse them entry into the country. So it's much easier to come via boat right right and also uh well no human is illegal but you know some people commit illegal acts such as coming to the country by boat illegally um, yeah without proper documentation so there's a lot of that uh happening as well but unfortunately we couldn't go to film on the venezuelan side because of the danger but i do intend to do that um at some point and what was it what was the the title going to be interestingly the title that i pitched uh to one world media was uh food for guns because we do have initially when the crisis started venezuelans were coming to trinidad to trade guns for food wow so how far is trinidad to venezuela eight miles Oh, it's close. Didn't realize it was so close. Yeah. yeah, between seven and eight miles, I believe. What was happening is because they were because of inflation, they couldn't. People can't afford food, so they'd come here and do some sort of trade. And 
I was told not to look into that. Right. Um, I was told that it's very dangerous and what I was doing would get me into trouble and put my life in danger. So I was told not to go in that direction. I took that advice. Yeah. And uh, But I did manage to get a few interviews with people who were talking about the trade trafficking um, of people, uh, sexual trafficking in both ways as well from Trent to Venezuela and vice versa. And as well, they did talk about the gun trade. However, they also didn't want their identity um, put Fair on, enough. on camera. So, so. so, so were you interviewing people who were what, involved in that trafficking? So yes. run, piloting the boats or... Yeah, um, well, I, I did interview one person who was trafficked. Who um, was trafficked? And Which way? She came here from Venezuela. Well, sorry, she came to Trinidad from Venezuela. Yeah. And it's it's a very common story where they have a friend who comes over or who is in this country or who is in the, the country they want to go to and they say, come over, I can get you a job. Yeah. Then the person comes to the country and they basically, she was locked in a house. They took away her phone. They didn't let her out of the house, but they would take her out to clubs to look for clients. And it's the same story. Either the girl, the person refuses or they fall into it and then they try to escape. Some women have escaped, but they they were being hunted down by these traffickers. Uh, they're making threats against them. Wow. Is yeah. that a big problem in Trinidad? Trafficking? Yeah. Was it isolated to the Venezuela crisis? And- no. I, we do not have the official statistics. To, I don't have the official statistics to make a statement like that. But trafficking is a problem in our country. Right, right. Fine. So the next documentary then. Perfect title. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, cool. So let me know. Well, let us know when the uh, documentary is out. Definitely. It'd be great to see it. Yeah. And so at the moment, you're looking, so you're doing your PhD in journalism. Mm-hmm. And specifically? There's been no serious amount of research in terms of journalism culture in Trinidad and Tobago. So initially, I was really excited to look at the defamation laws because as a journalist in Trinidad Tobago, you can still be put in jail if you're convicted of defamation. It's never been used, but right. it's still in the books. And so, a definition of defamation? So, for example, if I say, you know, if I publish somewhere that, you know, Lewis is laundering money, yeah. Lewis Miller is, is laundering money, and I post that somewhere, I'm defaming you. Fine, yeah. So then you can come and you can, t- in, a, in a litigious society like yeah, yeah. the UK, you can actually do that and have a, a, a foundation for that. But, you know, it, it's sort of seen as stamping out of freedom of speech for journalists. So I was very excited to to do that, to look at defamation law and how the government is using it to influence journalism culture. But I first had to ask, what is journalism culture? So I spent six months doing an ethnography back home in Trans Tobago where I interviewed 90 journalists. Exhausting. It's a lot of journalists. <laughs> Exhausting. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so I, uh, interviewing them and, and just asking them everything about their daily routines to you know, whether, how they feel about this law and um, everything within that spectrum. So just to get a real understanding of what life was like for a journalist, because even though I was a practicing journalist, it's still, I was in, I'm not, all the media houses are, are structured differently, they okay. have different, different management rules. Uh, so it's interesting just to get a, a, a proper understanding of everything you have to do, go to the different media houses to understand yeah. the culture there. And what's the specific law that you've been researching? So I've been looking, well, there are, very, there are a few laws. One of the laws, for example, is a cybercrime law. So uh, if I'm a journalist and you send me a document, and let's say it's a sort of a top secret document, but you send it to me and I open it electronically, I can get arrested. Oh, Even can, though you don't know what's in it. Yeah. So people can, so, so that's, and it's, that's a bit, it's a bit ridiculous. Yeah. You know, also something as simple as, um, but this hasn't actually, so these are things that are that are being discussed. The, you know, all of the people who are representing journalists are very concerned about these laws and they've brought them up in joint select committees. And so they're, they're these, we are asking for an amendment basically for journalists in this because it, because the cybercrime law doesn't exactly speak to journalists, but basically if someone has information that is leaked to them, Right, they're creating, they're you can, yeah. doing an offence, but we want an amendment for journalists. There's also parts of the law which says something like, if, for example, if you get into, if you're an archbishop and you get into an accident and you don't give your consent to publish your permission, we can't publish that you've been in an accident and publish details about you. 
again okay, yeah. something yeah so we're, so those are some those are some of the laws defamation law however for example if if you have information about a politician or someone in power that you and it's not just politicians someone in power that you want to hold to account and you publish it usually you get what or, or they find out you're going to publish it usually you get a pre-action protocol which tries to prevent you from publishing saying we will sue if you publish this information and it depends on the culture of a media house, whether they stand yeah. behind you, whether they stand behind their journalists, if they have insurance, what their lawyers are saying, which is why it's so important for journalists to do all their checks and balances before the story goes to print or to broadcast to make sure they're fully 100%, 100% protected yeah. against yeah. it. But the real question is, why is it still in the books? Yeah. We're not using it. Is no, it no, there absolutely. just to scare us? And, and, you, and interestingly, is, is there no... Could you do the PhD in Trinidad? How come you decided to do it in the UK? Lovely weather. Well, yeah. <laughs> Why else? Apart from that. No, there is currently no PhD in journalism in the Caribbean. Wow, at all? No. There are master's programs at Carrie-Mac in Jamaica. Right. Which usually is the hub where people go to do journalism in the Caribbean. However, there's no PhD and there's no pr- no provision Meaning that I had applied to also get funding for my PhD, and they said there's no provision for PhD students in Trinidad and Tobago. Full, even if you do it internationally. Even if I do it internationally. Harsh. So I'm looking for funding if anyone yeah. wants to. She if anyone plug. wants to fund, please <laughs> uh, get in touch. <laughs> and uh, so I am the first person in my country to do a PhD in journalism, and I believe in the Caribbean. Amazing. So. Awesome. Yeah. And how are you enjoying the UK? Well, I know really we spoke a bit about this. We did a little in terms bit. Of, oh, we spoke a little yeah, bit about it. Yeah. Well, I do. I think that it's gorgeous. I think that the architecture is amazing. I think that the history as well. Because we, we were a British colony, Trans Bagel, we did do a lot of his, history, British history. So to actually come to the UK and see a lot it's of quite the history familiar. that I've read about. Yeah, it was yeah. something really that I really appreciated. At the same time, living in the UK is quite expensive. I'm sure it is expensive. everyone can agree with that. Oh, for sure, for sure. And I and I do think that to really enjoy a, a really good standard of living, you also need to be, you know, you have to have a good income. So yeah. whilst a lot of great things like museums are free and a lot of, you know, you can go to the park and read in the dead of free winter. Free health service. That's not, yeah, that, that cool. actually is great too. But it can be tougher. I mean, it is expensive. It, yes. Yeah. Yes. For most, I mean, most major cities like this are, but. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also really exciting to be sort of a fly on the wall with Brexit and other things that are happening. Absolutely. So it, it, it is a great, I think... For any journalist, it's a very exciting place to be. Yeah, any, it must be quite interesting also with the various media sources and news channels and yeah. where people consume news from. Certainly yes. with the Brexit stuff. It must be super interesting. Yeah, I think... <laughs> I'm not on Facebook. You're not on Facebook? No. Wow. I might... Well, I say wow, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I was on not Facebook. Not everyone's on Facebook. I was on Facebook, right. but my account was... Uh, someone attempted to hack my account more than four times in one week more than four times i don't know why i have i really have nothing on it. so you decided what just to shut it down yeah, so i shut it down Fine. and because essentially i wasn't really using it very much so okay. i'm more on twitter i use twitter, twitter for my news sources all the time so I, every day i wake up and i look at different um news sources that are in my feed and i read from a variety of different news sources um, to get to get the most amount of information i should say okay so it's twitter that's good i love that so it's, tw- it's a twitter's your main source yes. of news yes and what do you do? Do you follow the hashtags and or you read it for you? If there's something I'm very specifically interested in, I will do hashtags. However, if you know, if I'm just waking up and looking through the news for the day, then I can just look at all the different everything like that people in. that you're following. So you look at your yeah. news feed. Yeah. Fine. And then your newsfeed so, will be filled up with whoever you decided to follow. Right. Which is the point you were making earlier. I was making the yes. But then if you have, you know, um So my point was for everyone that didn't hear the conversation. Right. Which is just us. <laughs> Is that, um, is that you tend to follow people like you and often they have a similar view, opinion about stuff. Mm-hmm. And Twitter's really cool because you can follow the hashtags and you can get a real sense of what other people who don't agree with you and aren't in your social mm-hmm. circle are feeling. So we talked about the Brexit mm-hmm. stuff. And, uh, and in my social media feeds, everyone was feeling the same as me. Um, and then I had no idea that we were going to end up leaving Europe. I thought we'd remain. But then actually, if you looked at Twitter, Mm -hmm. you've got a much better view of what people are feeling and thinking. And I do try to follow different polarities 
So I think that's healthy to have that kind of information. Also, what I like about Twitter is that reading some of the comments, especially on the direct news stories, not, so not just someone, a regular person reposting, but from an official news source, because if you have that official news source, you also have the different opinions from how many ever sides commenting on that official news source. So that's you true. can kind of yeah. have your finger on the pulse of how people are feeling from any side or anything like that. That's like, for example, listening to the radio in the morning. So if you listen to, so in Trinidad, we have a lot of talk radio. And so when I was back home and I would be driving in the morning or afternoon, I'd listen to a lot of the talk radio. And so that they, they would uh, sort of talk about the news of the day and then they would post a question. So how are you feeling about- On XYZ? Twitter? No, just to the, to the just listeners. Just pose a question, yeah. Yeah, to yeah. the listeners. And I, I'm sure they posted it on there. They would say, we posted it on our Facebook page and, and et cetera. Yeah. And then people would call in and discuss what they what they were thinking, which I thought was great because that's how you know what the public is thinking. And that sort of also feeds into a lot of uh, research that I was doing in terms of media agenda. Does the media set the agenda or does the public set the agenda and how they interrelate? And, and I found that it's never just one or the other as most things in life. It's yeah, always yeah. sort of a back and forth, which I think it also depends on the country you're in and, and also advertising policies and, and how that advertising affects That's things. true. The yeah. agenda setting is also dependent on that. But yeah. just with regards to the radio, um, listening to that. Uh, yeah, generally. I love the radio. Uh, I probably don't listen. To, I used to listen to it a lot more when I was younger. Um, and then we have like talk radio, talk sport. I mean, mm -hmm. there's lots of, it's really interesting. But now you tend to find people just call up and moan. And just <laughs> moaning about something, moaning about the bad the government's not doing this or their football club's not buying these players. And it's like constant, constant moaning, mm. which is quite cool to listen to, mm. but not all the time. Well, Cause for, it puts you forgive in me if I'm wrong, but didn't our forefathers live and die fighting for our right to moan? But absolutely, you can moan as much as you want. <laughs> absolutely. And they have a platform to moan, right. which is great. And you can moan if you want. And then I have the right not to listen to you. Exactly. Moan. <laughs> you, can but you can scroll through. <laughs> I could just I could just turn the channel off. Yeah. Right. But um, no, no, I, I, it's really cool. And there's a great place for it. And obviously podcasting. Mm -hmm. We can have a moan about anything we want. And people can choose to listen or not. But I think the, the great thing is now with technology, people have these platforms to be able mm. to express themselves. And now you'll be able to learn from so many different types of people. Because I was saying before, I mean, with obviously with YouTube, with um, technology, with podcasting and stuff, it used to be that you have to, be, you have, to have been able to read to learn. Mm. You have to read books and stuff. Right. Nowadays, you can be illiterate and listen. Or right. watch a video, and, right. which I think is really And I cool. think that also speaks to the different types of uh, ways that people are able to learn. And it's not just via, um, it's definitely not just via reading, but it's also auditory or just how we how we process information is so different. It's not just in that sort of industrial classroom anymore where you're writing on the chalkboard yeah, yeah. and you have to read it and memorize it. So, Have you seen a difference in Trinidad compared to the UK about how people are consuming their news and... Yeah, definitely, on a, on a lot of different levels. So, for example, I would say Trinidad is about 20 years behind the sort of technology revolution in journalism. So right now we have one company that's doing integration and online, so with online integration, trying to really push that. Um, and it, it is a legacy media house, so Guardian Media Limited, they're doing that. The other media houses haven't gotten there yet. Okay. So in terms of that, it is, but then again, it's very So, so it's all print, is it then? Yes. Yeah. But it's also very dependent on how a country's set up because most people like to hold newspapers in their hands. Do you still like to? I do. I love it. I love it. So if you're it's not... Like, it's like, I, I don't have a Kindle. But you get your hands get dirty there. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I'll always so, my Kindle. <laughs> so if you're not on Twitter, you'll be seen reading a proper newspaper. Yeah. 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 And I think it's really important because, for example, and I know that I didn't quite answer your first question but just to, to to talk about why it's so important is that um for example when you especially as a journalist you have to do product comparison you have to look at who else is doing the same story that you worked on do they have a different angle do they have a different source can i cultivate this source is there an angle that i that is unfair that i have not explored that i need to put into my follow-up story you know and just also look at the quality of photos or so in order to, I think, be a better journalist and, and just be ahead of the game, you absolutely have to pick up the product of the person or look at their newscast or look at or listen to their radio show or podcast so you can find out what they're doing and how they're getting the information so you can stay 10 steps ahead of them. But how do you choose who to listen to? So obviously you've got the big media mm -hmm. organisations. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but then you have like lots of individuals that can write anything on Twitter mm-hmm. or can report on anything. And suddenly it feels like now, certainly here, um, you've got information from absolutely everywhere. You've got no idea what's true, what's not, or what's been validated. Right. Even even published, people publish facts. I mean, we had the £350 million extra per week for the NHS, which mm-hmm. turned out not to be true, which is um, put on the sides of bus. I mean, how do you... Personal? Discerningly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a couple things. Well, I know that there are these really great fact-checking websites that are coming out where you can actually put information into in front of if they're real or not. But aside from that, I think just being really critical in your own thinking and really figuring out what it is you're reading or what you're consuming and not just consuming blindly um, and just really having sort of a, a base for things. A lot of people tend to sort of click on headlines or they don't even read the story. Like the clickbait they stuff. Just, yeah. And or they just literally read the headline and say, I know about this subject. So I think you also have to be fair. Be fair to what knowledge you have and you have to say, okay, maybe I actually don't know what I'm talking about or what I'm what I'm reading. I need to read more into it. And I know certain news um do you know hack hackers london no no tell me about them um, um i was i'm actually supposed to go to their um their event tonight oh nice again shameless plug um <laughs> no they're great i i just attend but they it's under the twitter headquarters and they the last time so they bring together people who do different apps and so forth and journalists and they do like te- new tech and journalism or they look at Brilliant. really great developments and things that can help journalism my point is that They came up with this, I think it was uh, FT. They have this new app that, or they're developing an app which can uh, track how much you've read on a subject. So let's say you're reading about robotics and they can actually tell how long you spend on the page and how long you've read it for. So you can say, well, I'm only 10%, you know, up to my stuff about robotics. So it actually lets you know personally, am I really an expert on this subject? Do I know what I'm talking about? Wow. And then what is that going to do for debates? They'll be like, let me see your stats. Mm -hmm. How much do you know about this topic? Exactly. I mean, I know, I know no, you're no. joking. No, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. It can, but. <laughs> but it can, but it can, it probably could be used, you know, in that. Yeah, because yeah. I think actually, you know, because then you see, then you have these Facebook wall wars, people back and forth. You yeah. know, imagine what a world, great world would be if you say, actually, do you really know what you're speaking about? Can you show me how much you've read on this? Absolutely. Which I think, you know. It's really interesting. Great. I think I found in all honesty that my, my reading of news articles has gone right down. And my my listening to audiobooks and mm. podcasts has gone right up because mm-hmm. for me I so I work in London I live uh, I live in London but my, my commute's about let's say half an hour and so uh, mm. so um, I don't read and I'm, and I travel on the Northern Line mm. so it's really difficult to actually read anything because it's right. too busy so yes. I started reading on my phone. But then even it was a little bit busy for the phone. Right. So I thought I'd just stick my headphones in. Mm-hmm. And this was about like two years ago. Because I was really re- realising that I don't really read books yeah. so much. And then the newspapers at the time, it was only, only negative stuff. So you just want to like, you're depressed by the time you get to your desk. So I stopped reading the papers in the morning. Um, and now I, I listen to stuff and it's great. And I've been going through lots of audio books. I listen mm. to podcasts. So that's, that's what I found. Like it takes a long time for me to... Well, it just takes it takes more time to read mm-hmm. than it does to listen. And because of my my life, my working life, mm-hmm. I found that I was I'm now consuming more media mm-hmm. um, than I was before. That's very interesting for people who are doing research on the life long of tea of print newspapers to know this information. Uh, well, I'm sure they're going <laughs> right down. Certainly here, because yeah. it's interesting. You were saying that. You love to hold the newspaper and in Trinidad, it's probably the main, still the main source. Well, it is. So our older generation is the primary, well, I don't want to say older generation, but, you know, in terms of demographics, young people definitely are using their devices to get their news. Advertisers are moving into targeting young people, well, younger people through those means. But definitely when you're driving to work in the morning, you see people buying the paper all the time on the street or, you know, just so that it it is. And um, newspapers will sell out by the time, you know, you get into the capital city. If you don't buy it on the street when you're in going in and the traffic keeps you back, it's gone. Do you have to pay for it? Yes. So here it's free. Almost all of them free. Well, because they used to have used to have the evening standard. It was always like 50p. Mm. My dad always used to get it. It's like 50p, right. get the evening standard. Now they give it away for free. Yeah. We have the, 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 the morning ones, the Metro, yeah. free. Um, I'm sure, but now you have like the main ones here, like the Times, the Guardian, Independent. They have their content behind, behind an online paywall. Mm-hmm. So you pay like whatever it is. I don't pay yeah. for it. The FT, I do. <laughs> economist stuff so so they have their content behind the paywall so mm-hmm. the the model 
seems has changed a bit yeah yeah and actually i think we are considering doing that as well one of our one of our newspapers internet they they do do that paywall they but i feel we don't get the majority of uh money for media internet by circulation it's by advertising yeah, yeah so yeah. also the advertising agenda play, plays a huge role in terms of what makes it into the paper and what makes it onto the newscast because if we have enough time or space oh, then I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll get printed or, or um or yeah. broadcast fine and you've, have you found now that the the media sources are getting better than they have been like, is the content better i think we live in an increasingly litigious society yeah and i think people are becoming more more and more aware of of information that's being put out there so now journalists are becoming a bit more hyper vigilant in what they're producing so in terms of legacy media i think the more training the more understanding of their what their rules are as purveyors of of information and, and they're there to serve uh, verification purposes that it has gotten better that they are moving in the direction of let's create a news source that is 100 percent for the people credible reliable credible, reliable yeah. then you have things you know like Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all these different other platforms that um, in terms of sources of media, if it's gotten better, I think it, I would say that that hasn't helped. Um, whilst a lot of these platforms can be used for incredible things and building incredible communities and movements and definite um, spreading of positive mes- messages, the downside as well um, is that it can also be used for spreading of false information, um, even you know, and and propagating things that are not helpful to society. So Facebook and yeah, because I think they've I think Facebook have just banned some of the far right groups here. So interesting, but that's like so. So you've got on the one hand you've got like the news organisations that mm-hmm. let's say are getting better quality, right? But then you have individuals who can do anything, right? Freedom of speech and so do you, do you think that's out of control now? To, to Facebook and Twitter, because the thing about Twitter, uh, someone was telling me the other day there was an AI, and it was a chatbot, and they mm-hmm. need to, they need to like train the AI on lots of data. Mm-hmm. So Twitter has loads of conversations, and I think within about two or three minutes it became racist, sexist, and homophobic, just from the conversations right. on Twitter. Right. People get venomous on Twitter because you can hide behind the computer, mm-hmm. you can be anonymous. Mm-hmm. Um, Facebook, you get loads of like bad stuff. Yeah. Um, so, do you think that they need to do more? Or well, I think we also touched on this in terms of when we were talking about climate change earlier. Yes. And, yeah. and I think that everyone has a role to play. You as an individual, the companies that are also having this platform. So, if you're providing a platform, yes, you can be a purveyor. But I do believe as well that you, as much as possible, need to. Like moderate moderate think? that's a that's the word i was looking for moderate yeah. what is happening um but also as an individual person who's on that platform in yourself you need to be responsible as well and you need to be respectful and you need to no one nobody wants to take away anybody's freedom of speech however at the same time it's we a all, very fine line we all have to share the society and world together and we all have to live next to each other and and it is a very fine line Definitely. No, I completely agree. I listened to a podcast with Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of, and founder of Twitter. And they, I think they have, they have a terms and conditions and stuff. It's very vague, but I mean, you can almost say anything on Twitter. I, th- mm. I don't think they kick off too many people. Mm. Not but at to the misquote, same time, but. you know, when you look at serious, serious issues of freedom of speech, right? Let's just, for example, take into consideration offences against children. So I remember I was listening to this uh, BBC podcast about this particular company where anybody can sort of do karaoke and post it online. Right. And some of the comments under these videos of these kids posting were extremely disturbing uh, and very and, and sexual in nature. Um, and this journalist did a bit of a test where they wrote to the company and said, because in their, in, their, in their policies, they say that they're going to try as much as possible to protect the, right, the rights of children, etc. And, and they reported it. And this, the, I think in their policy, it was something like within 24 hours, the content was supposed to be removed. But when right. they checked back, it wasn't removed. Uh. And so then a couple months later, they did a test again. And then they said, um, so some of the content was removed, but some was also, had also remained there. So when you get into things like that as, as well, I mean, in terms of responsibility, it is 
the platform's responsibility to moderate that. It is the parents' responsibility. It's also, in the world we live in, now we need to be educating our younger generation yeah, about sure. a lot of what's happening and, and how vulnerable they can be. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess, but to the, uh, to the tech firms, you don't really know how old people are. Although you, I guess you can do maybe some facial recognition, mm-hmm. a fingerprint, but they could take their parents' phones and they definitely need to do more. And if you're producing a, a product now, and I mean, again, this is just my personal opinion, but to be completely ethical, if you're putting something out there and you know the power that technology has to be completely ethical, you should have these safeguards and you should have these, you know, sort of um, mitigation uh, routes that you can take or, or the user can take to protect themselves. Yeah. No, I agree. So. No, I absolutely agree. In the UK, there there's plans to set up a tech regulator. Right. Which is quite interesting mm-hmm. to regulate the Facebooks and LinkedIn's and stuff. What do you think about doing that? Or have we gone a little bit too far? The thing is that I don't think that this is going to end. I don't think that, you know, I think in another year, another two years, there's going to be even more regulation. There's going to be another, there's going to be even more pushing because people are going even further. So it's like if people weren't going, if people weren't going far in the first place, there'd be no need to do the regulation. True. So it's sort of like, Chicken you mean people as in the individuals yes. posting on yes so yeah. if we were to sort of reg- again come back to regulating ourselves then there would be no need for this that's a utopia but a lot of people you know they they use these platforms they can hide behind it they can mm-hmm. get their venom out mm-hmm. um and it also brings out the worst in people i do and if you're you know because speak- also the sorry no go i was just saying speaking from that respect what essentially what i'm taking from what you're saying is that there will be no sort of there are people who just will not stop in the like in ben- what they're saying whether it's offensive or not so in in terms of that then i don't think we've gone too far because we need to protect people we need to protect children especially and if there are people out there who can't be responsible for themselves then it's our job as government, as people, as adults, as everyone, to protect each other and to protect and to protect children as well. No, very true, very true. It's interesting because a lot of people are like blaming the tech firms, mm. um, but they're just platforms right. for people to express themselves and be mean or be happy or to share their views. Um, it's yeah, it's a shame, but most I mean mostly it's good, and you just get this small minority of really vocal yeah. people that end up. Well, it's. At the end of the day, it's all communication and information, right? And communication is how we've built our societies, how we've evolved as a people. True. And without communication, we definitely wouldn't be where we are today. And throughout history, we've had positive communications. and Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing better than just meeting so, up, having yeah. a conversation like yeah. this, face to face. It's very different online. It is. You know, like you can you get a WhatsApp and then you read it and you can think about how to respond. Mm-hmm. Or you can ask your mate. Whereas I, I really like live conversations because right. you can just, you've got to respond like, to me. I like calling people, you know. Yeah, using the phone. Apparently that's old school now. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you've got to be able to. The art of conversation is great. And um, I think uh, my, some of my sociology colleagues can speak much better to this than I can. But it definitely is in some ways not as healthy for a lot of a lot of us to not communicate verbally or in person because then when you are constantly behind a screen i mean your skills your communication skills don't they don't evolve as they should and then as well yeah for sure you know there's a lot, also a lot of cyberbullying and also a lot of different types of grooming and shaming that happens online which i mean in person that also happens in person but online it's pretty exponential whereas in person i think on a case-by-case basis the numbers would be different no no i completely agree there's nothing like conversation i think it's a great point to end our first podcast we'll okay. definitely do another one amazing <laughs> thank you very much for coming in thank you for how can me. people find you uh on twitter <laughs> cool at aurora that's a-u-r-o-r-a-k Herrera, H-E-R-R-E-R-A. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Hey, folks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. <laughs>